The Naval Academy Museum presents A History of the Navy in 100 Objects. In 1900, after a successful American naval wireless communication test, the New York Herald trumpeted that the day of the flag and lamp signaling system in the Navy is drawing to a close. The Dewey of the next war, instead of signaling the course to be pursued by means of lights, as Dewey did when he entered Manila Bay, and thus exposed his position to the enemy watching on Corregidor Heights, will send out electric waves. The reality of the situation was starkly different. Just as Spanish forces were able to see Dewey's signaling lights, so can anybody with the proper equipment listen to radio communication. For today, let's take a step back and look at the history of naval communication. To help us in this, we are joined by Dr. Scott Harmon, retired director of the Naval Academy Museum, and Tom Cutler, naval historian, author, and director of professional publishing with the Naval Institute. This time we're looking at a rather inconspicuous item. It's a headset worn by an aviator, in this case a Japanese aviator, uh, and this headset was found on the island of Guam. And the idea of a headset brings up the larger topic of communications. Well, the advent of uh, wireless communications is a uh, revolutionary breakthrough for, for, for the Navy in general, and not just in aviation, but on um, surface ships and so forth. If you go, go way back, uh, frigates used to have to, the reason that frigates even exist in the Navy was because they were, uh, ran outside the battle line, uh, behind the battle lines, the, the two ships of the li lines, the ships of the lines would uh, fire at each other and these frigates would be behind there where clear of the smoke and so forth so that the Admiral could send his messages to the frigate who would then repeat the message by flag hoist and then ultimately uh, that's how everybody got their messages. Pretty primitive but it worked at the time. Well and of course you've got that, that doesn't work over long distances and so forth but when you come up with wireless communications now you've, you've completely changed the, uh, the battle space in a number of ways. The uh, the most obvious thing is that being able to send orders and, and coordinate uh, tactics and that sort of thing is, is, is huge. Um, but with that comes, there's a downside to that too because whereas semaphore and flag hoist and those kinds of things are all, um, um, only can only be seen by nearby people, radio communications go a long distance. They can go over the horizon and so forth. And that makes uh, uh, compounds things in a number of ways. It can alert the enemy that you're there if you're talking on radios. Now th that brings in things like high frequency communications versus low frequency. Low frequency will travel clear around the earth if you get down low enough. Um, stays inside the atmosphere so you gotta be real careful about lower frequency. Stay in the higher ranges you don't have that problem. You can communicate almost line of sight and just a little beyond the horizon. But as a result of all that, you've got, even today, ships rely sometimes on flag hoist because that's the only way to uh, uh, be sure that nobody is, is doing, unless there's a submarine with a periscope popped up nearby, they're not going to be reading your communications and knowing what you're up to. Aviation, uh, of course, benefited tremendously from wireless communications because when planes first started going aloft, the only way to communicate was by hand signal. I mean, they would, pilot, pilots would have to stay close enough to be able to go like this and you know these, these kinds of things to tell each other what to do and so forth so uh, as time once wireless communications come along now all of a sudden you can talk uh, pilots among themselves and, and, and again with with the advantages come disadvantages because once again you're up there communicating by radio those signals the higher you are the further those signals are traveling and that lets the enemy know that you're up there doing something uh, as well so it's a, it's a giveaway. So again, you've got to worry about emission control, MCON as we call it. And it strikes me that there are times when you want to communicate and times you do not want to communicate. An example of the second is the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, here they had to uh, take uh, six aircraft carriers, a couple of battleships, cruisers and destroyers across the North Atlantic to arrive within attack range of Pearl Harbor without giving away their location. So that meant radio silence. And the, the Japanese uh, were superb on this occasion in maintaining radio silence and getting within striking distance and launching the strike. The first that 
uh, communication that was made was by the flight leader, uh, Commander Mitsuo Fuchida, uh, who as he approached Pearl Harbor and realized that the Americans were uh, unaware of his approach, uh, gave the, the uh, iconic call, Tora, 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 or Tiger, 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 to indicate to the fleet that the attack was being carried out uh, without uh, prior notice, the Americans were unprepared. Uh, so here was a time uh, communications was kept secret, but at that critical moment, uh, the, the word was given back. Another occasion on the American side, the Battle of Coral Sea, a, a critical battle uh, which uh, was part of a large campaign uh, led off by the uh, Halsey Doolittle Raid on Japan, the Battle of Coral Sea, and finally Midway. At Coral Sea, uh, the Americans and the Japanese were searching for each other. They put out uh, flights of planes on search patterns uh, looking for the opponent. And finally, uh, a contingent of the Japanese fleet was found. A raid was launched. Uh, it was not the, the raid that they thought it was going to be, but the, the American pilots found a Japanese carrier, launched uh, attacks on it, and sank the Japanese carrier Shoho. The flight commander, uh, Lieutenant Commander Robert Dixon from the Lexington, sent back a brief message. Scratch one flat top. It caused jubilation aboard the, the American uh, ships, the Lexington, uh, a Japanese carrier had been caught on the open sea and sunk the first time an Amer a Japanese carrier had been sunk in the war. There would be others, uh, most notably at Midway, but here was a time when communications uh, among, from the planes, the pilots, uh, to the carriers uh, was uh, very noticeable, uh, very important to let the American uh, ships know that a Japanese carrier had been sunk. American naval interest in radio began during the great naval modernization of the 1890s as the United States' new fleet of battleships was built and was outfitted with electricity. In the 1880s and 90s, Lieutenant Bradley Fisk experimented with electronic communication prior to Guglielmo Marconi's successful naval tests. In 1897, Fisk patented some of his concepts but did not pursue them further facing significant opposition from senior leadership. It seems that this impacted his views on the matter of wireless communication, as Fisk would go on to oppose the use of such communication in the Navy in his later years. In spite of Fisk's and others' early work, the bulk of early wireless communication technology that was tested by the Navy was European, and the Navy studied and avoided making major investments until the technologies had stabilized. Nevertheless, the writing on the wall must have been clear to some senior naval leadership because in the 1901 Navy Annual Report of the Secretary of the Navy, it was recommended that the Navy discontinue its homing pigeon service as soon as wireless technology was more broadly implemented. In 1902, equipment was stationed at Annapolis. During a test, Secretary of the Navy William Moody tripped on a wire and slightly injured himself. The testers sent a message via wireless to their superiors in D.C., who then relayed the information to the Navy Department, making this one of the first wireless transmissions of a press or media event. Remembering the lessons learned in the Spanish-American War, the first permanent naval radio stations of the U.S. Navy focused on establishing communications with the furthest reaches of the American overseas possessions, including locations in Corregidor in the Philippines and Puerto Rico. However, although rapid and broad in scope, naval wireless communication development occurred in fits and spurts until it came under the guidance of a Naval Academy graduate who would go on to be called the father of American naval radio. On April 18, 1906, San Francisco was devastated by one of the worst natural disasters this country has ever seen. More than 3,000 people were killed and the earthquake and resulting three-day inferno leveled the city. The USS Chicago, newly radio-equipped, had departed the city just one day prior, and upon learning of the disaster returned to provide aid. 
With the city leveled, the ship's wireless transmitter offered the only means of communication. However, no one was really trained in its operation. Stanford Hooper, who had just graduated the Naval Academy less than one year prior in 1905, had some experience as a telegraph operator during the summers on the Southern Pacific Railroad. Midshipman Hooper was placed in charge of all relief communication efforts, relaying messages to an offshore telegraph station. The Army Signal Corps sent Midshipman Hooper some assistance, and for several days he ran all communication in and out of San Francisco. Hooper was appointed Fleet Radio Officer in 1912 and served as a radio observer during the first part of World War I. He also headed the radio division of the Bureau of Engineering until America's entry into the war. He received the Navy Cross for his action while in command of USS Fairfax during World War I, and following the war he became the guiding force behind the development of radio communication and electronics in the Navy, serving in various technical posts. Hooper was instrumental in allowing the Navy to have a viable wireless communication program by the time World War II broke out, and he remained on active duty until 1943, although this was actually extended until 1945. He was the recipient of many awards for his work in radio. After he retired, Hooper worked with civilian firms in the electronics field until his death on April 6, 1955. As communication innovation continues today at exponential rates, with networked ships and units, the Navy would do well to listen to its innovative and creative junior officers and junior sailors, so that it can create more Stanford Hoopers for tomorrow and fewer Bradley Fisks. So it's not a very auspicious uh, object, but we hope you will come in to the museum, uh, visit uh, the museum, see these objects for yourselves, and appreciate the contributions that American uh, sailors and officers have made uh, throughout our history. Thank you very much.